Now, someone who really doesn't need much of an introduction, he's an award-winning sports and wildlife journalist who manages to get a mention of World Land Trust in most unusual places, including the report on the royal wedding. Um, I'm sure you've read him in the Times, where his columns have raised thousands of pounds for land purchases and donations. He's also an author. He's written numerous books, including How to Be a Bad Bird Watcher, and he's currently working on a huge tome about the entire animal kingdom called 10 Million Aliens. Apart from all that, he's a World Land Trust Council member, Simon Barnes. Good evening, everyone. And next time I share a platform with Nick Davis, I, I, I'm, I'm going to go first. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to talk to you about the World Land Trust. I'm going to take it in three parts. Uh, world, uh, land, and uh, trust. Um, I'm going to do trust first. Uh, there's not much human life without trust. And um, if you're not capable of trusting, if you're not capable of being trusting, then you're not really worth all that much. World Land Trust, by being comparatively small and highly transparent, is far easier to trust than many much larger organisations. And also, it has the ability to strike up meaningful personal relationships with individuals in the overseas partner organisations. And that means that the World Land Trust is able to trust in its turn. And some of the most impressive achievements come from this axis of trust. Now, let's move on to world. And this is an interesting one because it, the meaning of the word has changed radically over the last half century or so. Um, originally it meant something huge, something mighty, something all-encompassing. When you said, I'd give the world for this, you meant there was nothing that could possibly be bigger in the human mind than the world. Well, now the world is a very different sort of idea. It probably changed first with the Apollo 17 picture of the Earth from space, taken back in 1972. And then we saw that the world is not actually a great mighty entity after all. It's a small blue dot in limitless space, lonely, life-laden, almost infinitely fragile. It was suddenly clear that this world is the only world we've got. And admittedly, we still carried on as if we had several more to spare. But even as we do so, we are aware of the desperate frailty of our world and of the need to do something about it. So there's one more topic left to discuss and the more astute of you will probably have realised that this is uh, land. <laughs> now land is stuff that matters very deeply. It matters to us humans with our hearts and our minds and our souls and our guts. So well, say a piece of land comes up next door to your place. Perhaps it's only tiny. It's enough to grow a few roses or a few spuds or just to set down a chair and a table to put your drink on. But you want it. And you pay for it. You pay way above the going rate for it. You pay 10, 20, 30, 50 times the going rate for it. Not because it makes your property more valuable, but because it makes your place more meaningful. Naturally, you dig deep for a piece of land like that. I mean, after all, one thing you never hear anybody say is, you know, the one thing I really regret is buying that piece of land when it came up next door. <laughs> so let's go to Kerala. It's in the south of Indo, and it's a bit of land that's really pretty tiny as these things go. A measly 34 acres. It's very like the scrap of land that comes up next door to your place then. But in the same reason, it has meaning and it has significance, and it has both because of elephants. But first, before I went there, I went to a brand new village, the village of Chikali Anapura, and here I had the pleasure of cutting the ribbon to open a spanking new house in this village. Each house had one third of an acre of hyper-fertile ground, ground suitable for the growing of spices, a high-value crop, and the very heart of India families had all unrooted from their ancestral homes to come here and they'd done here of their own personal choice after a great deal of discussion and an awful lot of time. But now as we went there, there was a great fizzing excitement in the air, an air of festival, of tamasha. 
Some people were so excited they couldn't speak. Some people were so happy they couldn't stop. It was a great moment in history. It was a great privilege to be there. I asked them, was it a hard decision to move here? And it was here I, heard, I first heard the Manai alarm for it was a bloody no-brainer. <laughs> the village had stood right in the middle of an elephant corridor. An elephant corridor is like the elephant in the room, only different. Um, <laughs> elephants had moved constantly across this piece of land, through the village, on the way from point A to point B, going through the village as they went and generally snacking on the paddy fields as they went. Uh, one woman described to me what it was like being in a house that was being casually, playfully knocked down by a passing elephant. I kept very still and very quiet, she said. <laughs> well, now the old village has gone, and it belongs, well, it doesn't belong to anybody, really. It's technically it belongs to the Forestry Department of India. The point is that this corridor, that this land, is now safe. This village move was organised by the Wildlife Trust of India, it was financed by the World Land Trust. And now, instead of being full of uh, frightened and resentful villagers, <coughs> it's now full of passing and repassing elephants while the villagers grow their spices far from damage and danger. So then I went to see the old village, the old piece of land, to walk on it, to touch it. It looked shockingly small. But then, land in India is shockingly expensive. It's the most densely populated country on earth after China, and it's full of development and boom, and at least for some of them, money. It would be lovely if we could buy up billions and billions of acres and make them safe forever, but it's just too expensive. So instead, we must be selective, witty, meaningful. Stand on the land of this abandoned village, it's gloriously <coughs> obvious, two big areas of forest, and the ex-village in between. Now you've taken out the village, you've at once doubled the value of both these huge pieces of forest. You have allowed the animal populations of both forests to cross and to intermingle, enriching their lives and crucially adding depth to the gene pool. And after all, a corridor that's big enough for an elephant is going to be big enough for everything else that walks or crawls on the surface of the earth. So this, then, it's the way forward. Brilliant, light on your feet, punch above your weight strategy. Being so clever and so stylish and so deeply involved with the local people that you can use a comparatively small sum of money to bring about a comparatively large miracle. This is not land purchase by buying up the entire Amazon. It's land purchase by buying up this patch of land that comes up next door. It may not look very much, but it means everything. And so I walked across the land. I did so with John Burton, head honcho of the World Land Trust, and with Vivek Menon, who's head of the Wildlife Trust of India, who's a man of great style and flamboyance, who looks like the uh, pirate chief in a Bollywood musical. <laughs> As we walked across, we could see the shells of the abandoned houses. We could still make out the ghostly shapes of the paddy fields. But the vegetation it was already waist high and higher, and everywhere there were great loaves of elephant dung. Vivek gestured vastly. Look at this land, he said. This is our land, and it is ruined. He then raised his hands above his head like an umpire signalling a six. Ruined, he said, and I am so happy. <laughs> and I shared that happiness, and you and we can all share that happiness. It's a happiness that comes from that magical, brilliant, impossible stuff called land. And we can find this happiness through the World Land Trust because they deal with land. They do it all over the world. And what's more, you can trust them. <laughs>